Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Jane Potts, and with me is Amir. And Hello, we, will be, we will be doing a presentation on grid scale energy storage, followed by a Benny Patry virtual workshop. So I hope everyone has been able to find some of the stuff put on the itinerary. Uh, just to recap, that is some copper coins, some zinc coins or washers, some salt water, and preferably an LED kitchen foil and a little bit of kitchen towel. But to start with, we'll tell you why it's important to know a little bit more about energy storage. So what is the current challenge? So the reason we want to be able to store energy is because we want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, hopefully by 80% by 2050. So that's around 50 grams per kilowatt hour, that's quite a bit. So by now, we were hoping to have around 30% of UK electricity demand coming from renewables. And if you go to electricinsights.co.uk, you will probably be able to see that we're actually using more than that for renewables right now, which is really great. However, that's not good enough because we are still using up resources we do not have and we want this planet to get better and better. So we want to be pretty much decarbonized by 2030 at the latest. But with a growing demand due to electric transport, electric heating and everything else, as well as our growing population, we do not have enough electricity at the moment. And with things like solar being dependent on the weather, we need to be able to store that so we have it whenever we need it. How do we tackle that? We tackle that with sustainable forms of energy combined with batteries. So two of the big renewables being produced and used at the moment in the UK are solar and wind. You can't really miss them. If you go out along the hillsides, you'll have a load of wind turbines. However, these are only around 30% efficient, which means that energy is also wasted in other forms. So that still needs storage because it's not windy all the time, although in Wales it is most of the time. I can't deny that the one outside my window is actually still spinning right now. And then we've also got solar, but that's also quite low efficiency at the moment, although it is my job to try and improve that, make them bigger, make them better and far more efficient in our delightful British weather. Although right now I can't be ironic, it is pretty delightful. I just can't go outside into it. But to make these things worthwhile, we need to store them. So that's where we come in. So a little bit more about where Amir and I work for. So we work for SPECIFIC, which is actually an acronym for Specific Product Engineering Center for Innovative, Functional and Industrial Coatings. Don't worry, you don't have to remember that, but uh, I quite enjoy remembering it. And I used to get given jelly babies every time I could say it. But moving on. So what we do is develop buildings as power stations. And we do this through our Swansea University based research group, where we come up with different building designs, which are usually solar based, along with energy storage. So Amir works on batteries design. I work on PV and resistive heating designs. And when you put all of this together, you can start to create buildings. So what you see on the screen at the moment is our active classroom currently stationed at Swansea University and it is producing enough electricity that we can also charge all of our electric vehicles off of it, which is really, really useful. But where else is this being used? If you were to drive into Bridge End at the moment, maybe not right now, but when we're allowed to drive around the place again, go to Bridge End, you will find a little row of houses which are all completely off grid where the batteries are actually stored in their sheds at the back of the house. I've been around them, they are absolutely beautiful, so you do not have to compromise on quality when it comes to sustainable design. And another thing you may see around some of our Welsh train stations soon will be the solar-powered active train shelters, which will have the solar-powered roofs with all of our lovely panels, which flex around the roof, and then the batteries stored up in the roof. So these things are really useful and can be move forward to enable us to design something which is completely off grid but we need batteries so energy storage what is it so i'm pretty sure all of us know what batteries are they're in our laptops they're in our phones they're in pretty much every device you'll find around the house uh, i mean 
it's great having a lithium ion battery, but we all know some of the downsides to batteries. But energy storage has been around since the beginning of time. So there's always been energy storage in different forms, mainly in chemical. But let's have a look at where it starts. So a torpedo ray is actually nature's own battery. So the way this works is electric currents are generated in their cells called electrocytes. And when an electrocyte is stimulated, a movement of ions move across the cell membrane and this enables an electric discharge, which is how a battery works. So these electrocytes are normally arranged in columns within electric organs. And this arrangement increases the electrical output, much like a row of batteries, which you'll get when they're placed end to end. But moving on, so looking at some of the early battery designs, this is voltaic pile, and this in essence is what we'll be making today. So it just involves a pair of electrodes, one being positive, one being negative, with an electrolyte in between. And when you allow the charge to pass through, you can generate energy. So this is our first one. This was created in 1799. And for our example, we'll be using copper and zinc electrodes in salt water electrolyte. So if you haven't got it to hand now, maybe find a little bit of time whilst we're starting the practical to get to hand. I'm pretty sure most people will have some coins at home, have a little bit of salt lying around, just mix it together in a bowl and we'll be able to make these for ourselves. But moving on, the issue with voltaic pile was not only was it pretty damn large, it was also not rechargeable, which um, I mean, imagine carrying something around strapped to your phone and having to replace it all the time. Nah, not my way. So moving on, we have lithium ion batteries, which are really great rechargeable batteries. Although some people, if you've been on YouTube and typed in uh, things like Samsung phone exploding, you will know that there have been issues with such designs in the past, as they can be a little bit on the flammable side. However, most modern designs are substantially less flammable and less likely to require being thrown out the window very quickly. I've only ever had one phone I've had to throw out the window very fast. And I will hopefully never abuse a battery again after that. So let's have a look at some early designs. So batteries haven't always been these lovely slimline things which you can just shove in the back of your phone. They were these big clunky things. So starting with capacitor laden jar back in 1745, moving on to the Grove voltaic cell. Grove's pretty great, mainly because it comes from Swansea, not that I'm biased. And then moving on to a design a little bit closer to what we know today, which is the one volt defined by the Daniel cell, and that was in 1836. However, luckily, most of our batteries don't look like those anymore. But how do they work? So the basics are that you can transfer chemical energy into electrical energy, or if it's rechargeable, you can transfer electrical back to chemical and switch around whenever you need it. So I've got a couple of phrases at the bottom, which will be a bit useful for you guys if you're interested in trying to remember this for future. I may have memorized these just before my exams and wrote them on my back of my books and memorized them really well. That wasn't all that long ago, admittedly, that was some of my doctorate exams. I still, you still have to remember them even now. So the best one is oil rig, which is oxidation is loss and reduction is gain. So this is referring to the oxidation of anode and reduction of your cathode, which we'll go through a little bit more in a bit, and red cat, which is reduction always occurs at the cathode. If you remember these two things, it'll be a lot easier to understand what's coming next. So how do we actually get two metals to behave as a battery? So batteries are simply electrochemical corrosion reactions. So when you have, say, your car outside for too long, in a, especially in Swansea, in a salt water environment, you will probably get quite a bit of corrosion if it's left there for far too long. But if we can capitalize on this reaction, when you have two met metals with these different potentials, and you can put them in electrical contact while immersed in an electrically conducting corrosive liquid. So in Swansea's case, salt water, the different potentials of the metals in liquid allow a current to pass from the anode to the cathode. So if you have a look at the screen, 
your one metal will become a cathode. So this is the metal with your positive potential. And then the other, so in case of what we'll be doing today, will be zinc. So this will have your negative potential. And between the two, you have a potential difference of one volt. So this will enable us to get our battery. Um, however, another thing to bear in mind for later is if you cannot find any zinc washers, beware of when your 10 or 5 pence coins were made because they could have completely different materials in them. So some 10 pences will have enough zinc that we have a rather decent potential difference, but some of them are mainly nickel. So if we have a look up here where nickel is, you've only got minus 2.5 which means that we get a substantially smaller potential difference of around half. So you may need a pile probably at least twice the size of my one if you're going to try it with that. You're also welcome to try it maybe with your aluminium foil if you can't find five or 10 pence coins. But one thing to bear in mind with that is it can oxidize. And the issue with it oxidizing means that we're not going to be able to get it to actually oxidize during the process as already a bit useless so bear that in mind do not be disheartened if you can't get your led to light up immediately that might be the reason so we will troubleshoot that when we come to the workshop so what are the components of the battery so as i mentioned we have our two electrodes these are the anode which is your negative electrode and during charge it will oxidize eh, sorry it will oxidize during discharge whereas the cathode will be your positive electrode and that will be reduced during discharge by taking in the electrons which are given out from that. So, but to enable this passage, we need an electrolyte. So in this case, we will be using salt water, which means that we have an ionic conductor to enable the ionic transfers charge between the anode and cathode. So there is an example of where you can get batteries when you really don't want them. Uh, so I'm going to give you a hypothetical scenario and I won't tell you where this occurred, but um, it's kind of real. So there is this um, underground tunnel somewhere in the world, uh, which was recently electrified. And um, there was a little bit of a problem because they had two materials which were rather different on this scale and had quite a lot of electric potential between them in a salt water environment. And they were very surprised when suddenly parts of their tunnel started rusting within a few months. So guys, always beware. You can make a battery even when you're not expecting it. If you do a bit of research, you might find out what I'm referring to. So yes, anode, cathode, electrolyte, and we're good. And what we'll be making today is a cell. So this is one set of electrochemical couples. Battery is when we have more than one, which can either be put in series together to boost the voltage or in parallel to boost the current. So we're making a primary battery today, which is non-rechargeable, but most batteries these days, which are useful to us are secondary batteries. So rechargeable ones like your mobile phone, like your laptop, like everything which doesn't require batteries that you have to check out all the time, which is really good. So how does this work? So we have two stages in batteries. We can either have them discharge, which is what's happening when we're giving out energy, or we can have it charging, which is what happens in the case of recharging a rechargeable battery or storage cell. So in the case of discharge, you will have the electrons flowing from the anode to the cathode with the negative ions going towards the anode and the positive cations going towards the cathode. And then this will flip in terms of where it's going. So it will go towards, in this case, it'll be the copper will become the cathode instead of the anode if it were rechargeable, I wish. And then the nickel will become the anode. So one thing to probably figure out from this is it always goes from the anode to the cathode. But let's go a little bit more into detail as I think that's a bit rough. So in the case of discharge, what's happening? So we have our electrons throwing flowing from the anode, which in this case is your copper. And what's happening here is your copper, sorry, iron will be having, oh, 
I'm getting ahead of myself and thinking only of what we're making later. So in this case, we've got iron. So your iron is going to be oxidized, which will allow it to give out electrons. These will be transferred through your electrolyte and then accepted by your cathode, which in this case is a nickel. So what you're getting here is your anode being oxidized and giving out your electrons and then the cathode accepting those electrons and reducing the material. Whereas when we have it charging back, we have it reversed, but always flowing from the anode to the cathode. So in this case, you have an anodic reaction happening with your nickel and you have a cathodic reaction happening with your iron. So the iron was reduced and the nickel is oxidized to enable it to go back to being able to emit more power. So we have two examples today. Uh, the first one, I thought we probably wouldn't do because at the moment we're already having an issue with getting food in the supermarkets. But in the future, when um, there isn't a pandemic, if you have spare lemons, you're more than welcome to try making a lemon battery as well, which works in a very similar way. But in this case, the lemon juice is your electrolyte and your copper and your zinc are still your electrodes. So those can also light up an LED. But today we're going to try making it from what I hope you will have around the house. So the penny battery, which is also known as the voltaic pile, will be made up of copper coins, some zinc washers or coins, and then your salt water, and then some tin for your bottom electrode, and your kitchen towel, which is looking a bit like a ghost in my image right now to soak up all of your electrolyte and then hopefully if you have them lying around an led to prove it works if not we'll find the alternative so as with the voltaic pile we will have it assembled so that you'll have groups of your positive electrode with your negative separated by the electrolyte and then you'll stack them when on top of each other so just quickly acknowledge thank you to the university and dr mabbott for letting me use some of his stuff for this. But now, if we switch to my screen, I will give you a quick demonstration of how you're going to do this. So don't worry, we will do it with you during the actual practical. This is just going to be me giving you a demonstration of how to do it step by step. So if we push the screen down to show everything below me, what we're going to need is to get some aluminium tin foil, place that down, and this is our bottom electrode. And now we're going to work up to make our cells. So we'll start with our zinc at the bottom. And then if I get my salt water, so as you can see here, we've got quite a lot of salt. So you can still see the salt crystals as so you need really, really salty water. So please do not drink this, it is not good for you. Then we will get a little bit torn off from our kitchen towel. Soak this in the salt water. Try and dry some of it off because we don't want it dripping between our piles. Place it on top of the zinc and then put our copper coin on top. Another thing to note is I'm using rather shiny coins which have been cleaned in vinegar beforehand. The reason being is because if they're nice and shiny and clean and they haven't got an oxide layer on top, it's got a better chance of producing better current. And so I'm going to do this a few times in a row. Build up my pile. I'm going to do this around six times. As you can see, I make my pile, but there is nothing between each of the individual piles. It's just contact between the zinc and copper. Uh, a good thing to note is each time cell does one stack. That's essentially one cell. Now, as you increase the number of cells, you're increasing your voltage. So an example would be if I were to use my multimeter, which I have alongside me, and take the voltage now. So I will turn this on. And 
place it here where you can see it. So just make sure it is in screen. You can see it fluctuating because I'm touching it. But if we get it right way right round, so red is positive, black is negative, we should yeah. have voltage reading. So I'm my hands are moving a bit too much and I am knocking the pile. But at one point before it started to slide, it did. It was around 2.3 volts. Yeah. So we'll try that again. Yeah. I seem to have knocked it and it's gone down a bit sadly. But yeah, so around one and a half to two volts. So then we'll what, see what that gets up to. So I'll let Amir continue talking, sorry. So yeah, so we've got three cells there now, I think. Is that right, Sarah? Three cells? We currently have three, yep. Yeah. yeah, so if, if we keep stacking now, when we get to say six cells, if we take the voltage again, obviously we should have increased our voltage by the same amount, theoretically. <coughs> yes. I may only get to five as I seem to have dropped one of my washers. That is a shame. And then we'll be able to make one more because I can't find my other washer. So I'm really soaking it in, wiping it off so it doesn't dribble everywhere. Place it on top and stack it away. And so if we take a reading now, around three volts. Yeah. This is yeah, so I mean, it, 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 definitely, it definitely shows it works. That's, that's a, a good value. Uh, it's a little lower than what I'd like, but if I push it down, hopefully you can just about see this is actually lighting up. Yep. So I'll take it off so you can see it without being up. That's it now. And oh, it was really bright for a sec. Let's try another one. Uh, yes, it does help to have multiple LEDs to hand just in case they start to die. But if you only have one, that is more than fine. Oh, that was really bright for a sec. <laughs> I think they're mocking me. <laughs> Come on. There. People see that? I don't know. My finger was on top of it. Yeah, you can see that. Just about to see it. All right. I'm going to try it twice more with other ones. If anyone's got any questions on that, guys, as well, don't be afraid to ask in the chat. We can yeah. go over anything you want. So that is probably the end of the demo.